And I continued to fly. And on February 3, 1945, I was delegated to lead the 3rd Bomb Division. Our group was leading the 3rd Bomb Division on this mission to Berlin. <clears throat> and it was such a perfect day. Everything occurred perfectly. We rendezvoused perfectly. We rendezvoused with the fighters perfectly and started out. The sun was shining, not a cloud in the sky. It was a lovely day until we came to the IP and our plane was hit. We had dead on board. We had, uh, <clears throat> we had uh, fire, smoke in the cabin, and uh, a couple of engines out. We proceeded to lead, dropped our bombs, and then were forced to turn the lead over to the deputy. And we turned, I ordered the navigator to turn us eastward because we had been briefed that morning that the Russians had crossed the Vistula in Poland and were approaching the Oda, which was 50 to 75 miles east of Berlin. So <clears throat> we headed toward the east, and finally I knew I couldn't keep that plane going any longer. I was afraid something drastic would happen, and I ordered the crew to bail out. And I found out 40 years later that some of them had ended up in, in German hands, and one had parachuted and his chute caught in a tree, and he was lynched by German civilians. And the pilot, uh, John Ernst, went out the Bombay doors and gashed a leg, was picked up by the Russians, taken to a, a Russian field hospital, and his leg was amputated without the benefit of anesthesia. They gave him some vodka. Phyllis and I heard that story 40 years later, and I was very unhappy. I, <clears throat> I finally left the controls of the plane, and I was, the plane went into a, into a spin, and I was pinned by this centrifugal force, and I couldn't move. I felt that I was in quicksand. I had to force myself inch by inch to leave the, co the cockpit, to go down to the front hatch. And finally, I pushed my way out and came out and I opened my chute and I thought I was in heaven. There was no smoke, no fire, no noise. And boom, I hit the ground very hard. And I looked up and I saw three soldiers coming at me, one with a rifle, was gonna strike me. <clears throat> I saw they had red stars on their hats and I yelled, Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, Lucky Strike, Coca-Cola, Amerikansky, bomb in Berlin, and they recognized me as an American. <laughs> <clears throat> and they, they picked me up and took me to a, a hospital. They put a cast on my arm. They gave me some penicillin, which was bad. I developed the hives. I had to remain there. Finally, they took us to a farmhouse <clears throat> and put us in charge of a a woman named Hannah, who was built like a tackle at Notre Dame, but had a heart of gold. And she fed us, fed us hamburgers morning, noon, and night. It was horse meat, but it was a delicacy at that time. And I haven't had a hamburger since. <clears throat> and from there, they took us to a Russian airfield, and uh, we were treated to an evening with the uh, group there and they plied us with vodka, which was Russian GI vodka. It looked like gasoline and it tasted like gasoline. And we got looped and I didn't know that, I didn't know that the uh, men danced with men in Russia. And the commanding officer asked me to dance. I was a little perturbed. I didn't know who would lead or if we had to dip. <laughs> <clears throat> well, we danced we had a, and they treated us very well. And in the evening, they put us to bed on, on wooden boards. What we didn't know is they were on wooden horses, and one wooden horse was lower than the other. In the middle of the night, these loop guys rolled over and ended up on a pile on the floor. And we were taken eastward, and we saw tremendous devastation, large places with, with uh, barbed wire around them, concentration camps. We saw the rocket attack on Posen at night. And I was taken to, a, to live with a, the mayor of a Russian town. 
And uh, he put me up in a bedroom that had not been used in five years, and the temperature was below 30. It was in February, and I chatted all night. It was the worst night of my life. But they fed us, and finally, after three days, the mayor came to me and said, we've run out of food. Would you appear with me to, in front of the Russian commandant to get us food? And I said, of course. So I appeared, and this mayor spoke English and Polish, and we needed a, an interpreter who would speak Polish and Russian. So I appeared, and I started my, my spiel to tell him who I was, and uh, then the Polish mayor would get up and interpret, and then this other interpreter would get up, and he was, a, he was sort of a, a flunky. He was trying to make points with the Russian general, and he bowed low in front of this general every time, and with that, he would boot me with his, with his fanny. And I was in no mood at that time to take that. I, I was tired from sleeping in the cold, my arm hurt, I was testy, and the third time he did that, I booted him in the family right onto the desk of the, of the Russian general, who started to laugh, and he gave us all the food we wanted. <laughs> <clears throat> and then they, they flew us to, to Moscow, we had lunch with Ambassador uh, uh, Harriman, Averill Harriman. They called a press conference, and I was able to send a, a telegram to my mother. I was okay. She had gotten a, my, uh, my family had gotten a missing in action telegram. They hadn't shown it to my mother who would have collapsed. And I cleared that up, and I wired to General Partridge, head of the 3rd Bomb Division, I said, save my job, I'm coming back. And I, after five days, we left Moscow, came back by way of Poltava, Tehran, Cairo, uh, Athens, Naples, and back home, where I resumed my job. And the war was coming to an end at that time. The last time I flew with the 100th was after the war had stopped we picked up uh, uh, French GIs who had been forced into slave labor in Eastern Europe. And these were guys who looked like skeletons. We picked them up, we loaded the 17s with them. We would take them, we were supposed to take them to an airfield 150 miles south of Paris. And I decided I would take them over the Eiffel Tower. I told them where we were, and they all regurgitated, and the plane reeked. It was the worst decision I ever made. <clears throat> well, I made a lot of other decisions. Like but uh, then the war came to an end, and I got my orders to go home. And uh, General Partridge, head of the 3rd Division, ordered a, an inspection of all the bases and parades on the bases because... Now the, the ground crews had nothing to do. They had worked feverishly, day and night, doing their job. They were tremendous. And of course, the flying crews had nothing to do, so they were trying to get some discipline in there. And so I took my orders and was headed up the hill toward my quarters, and down the hill came this motley group of people completely out of step with their shirts billowing out, and I started to laugh to myself, and as I passed them, one master sergeant turned to me and he said, Rosie, you would leave when things got tough. 